This is uh, Bob Phillips, Act producer for Research Pays Off. Welcome you to the webinar. Um, I'm supposed to remember to plug our um, pavement workshop in May, May 23rd, May 24th. If you haven't got that on your calendar, please uh, pencil that in for us. Um, welcome. Uh, here's Kurt to introduce Rebecca. Uh, hello, this is Kurt Turgeon, uh, pavement engineer. Uh, we've been working with these kinds of technologies for quite a few years now, and the, the reason behind it is, is probably twofold. One is when you look at our sampling and testing rates versus the quantities of material we're putting out, uh, we're really not gaining as much information as we'd like about the stuff we're buying and paying for. And I think the other thing we're seeing is this new generation of people uh, aren't big on, they probably don't really have the time to learn these things out of a book. They're very used to learning things on their phone and seeing things on an LCD screen and reacting to them. And that's one of the things we're seeing with uh, people getting hired off the street. One day they're setting cones and the next day they're, they're running a roller. The, the better and quicker we can put the information into their hand to respond to, uh, the better a product we're getting. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca. She's in charge of our advanced materials and technology engineer, and she knows all the details. So with that, go ahead, Rebecca. All right, thank you, Kurt. Um, if anybody's having any trouble hearing me, uh, do tech, uh, chat to Bob, and he can let me know if there's any communication issues here. So as Kurt said, we're going to talk about paper-mounted thermal profiling today and um, the beta software to identify workmanship issues here on asphalt paving here in Minnesota. I'm going to go through the quick ad here for the pooled fund that we have going. We're always looking for more participants. Any states out there that haven't joined, uh, do feel free to contact me and get more information on the, the pooled fund here. I'll go through the deployment schedule here in Minnesota, some specification highlights, uh, identify some workmanship issues here that we have been able to identify during construction, and a, a quick VEDA demonstration. So the pool fund is TPF 5334, uh, and currently we have 12 states that are participating. So you can see here on the map we have Oregon, California, Minnesota, Alaska, Missouri, Mississippi, Georgia, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, Maine, and Ohio just joined here uh, last Thursday, Friday. So total commitments to date on our website on the, the pooled fund FHWA website is 725 $26,000 uh, commitments, funds that we've received through the DOT here is close to 400000 And so uh, that money then we, we spend on VEDA enhancements. So the main objectives of this pooled fund, the first being uh, to provide a, a venue for enhancing VEDA. So adding more features to the VEDA software that allows geospatial viewing of both intelligent compaction, thermal profiling data, and future data in the, fu in the future here that has coordinates associated with it. So for instance, your rolling density meter data will, will be another important to VEDA here in the future. Uh, the second item that we go through with the pooled fund here is a technology exchange. So during all our meetings, we do share lessons learned with the group uh, between all the other states and share our specifications and work together here to move forward the technologies. So uh, if there's any comments or questions, you know, feel free to let me know throughout. It's more fun to have an interactive presentation here. So our deployment schedule through MnDOT, and this is for both intelligent compaction and thermal profiling. We established a roadmap back in 2014 uh, just to allow for transparency with our contractors and our vendors out there and also our state agency, uh, the different departments within our state, and to allow people to get the resources that they need to be able to deploy the technology and the knowledge that's needed. So back in 2014, the green bars here on this graph are, is our roadmap. The blue is the intelligent compaction projects, and the red is our, our thermal profiling projects. On the vertical axis here, you can see it's reflecting percent of projects meeting our, our project selection criteria. So we were shooting for about 10% of the projects back in 2014, uh, about 75% last year, and 100% full deployment here for 2018. So you can see we were able to achieve our roadmap goals and beyond each year as we've been moving forward here. So we haven't had any hiccups here, and so we are indeed moving forward with full deployment here this construction season here for both intelligent compaction and thermal profiling technologies. 
when we say full deployment, it's not on every project, so we do have a project selection criteria. Right now for intelligent compaction, we are requiring it on our stabilized fold-up reclamation, our cold-in-place recycling, cold central plant recycling, our ultra-thin bonded wear course, our plant mix asphalt, and our stone matrix asphalt projects. Thermal profiling, we're requiring that on our plant mix asphalt and our stone matrix. So a project size, right now we're doing net lane miles of four lane miles or more. So we don't want to put it on too small of projects yet as people are purchasing the systems. Intelligent compaction does require site calibration too. So at at some point we need to determine cost effectiveness as you get uh, smaller sizes but as people get more and more systems out there on their paving crews and uh, more experience with the technology we may look at decreasing the project size uh, to a smaller net lane miles data cellular coverage we do require that at least one time per day and it, the goal with that is to be able to transfer the data from the the technology itself to a remote server so regardless of where we are if we're in a field office if we're back in the office we can collect the data and download it and look at it on our data from wherever we're at. So we have had data issues when we didn't require cellular coverage, uh, that direct transfer to remote server, where we lost anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the data just from human error trying to use jump drives to transfer the data to the department. So we no longer allow that and are requiring direct transfer to remote server at least one time today, uh, per day. And we also require 100 percent satellite coverage within the project limits. We also have a roadmap for our submittals, and that's both for our VEDA projects and our forms. Uh, you can see prior to 2016 here, uh, our office here at Central Office, our unit, uh, we were the ones that created the VEDA projects and the required forms uh, to submit to the project file and um, obviously we were the ones reviewing it and we had no due date for the, the submittal we would just make sure we got it uh, to the districts before the projects were being closed out for any uh, monetary price adjustments that may be associated with the technology uh, 2017 through 2018 was the first year that we started moving over the creation of the VEDA projects and forms to our contractors so we were gearing up for that uh, letting them know that in advance probably or I think somewhere around 2015 we started saying hey you know around 2017 here we're, we're going to be moving that over into your court so we didn't want to do it too soon we wanted to make sure the beta software was where it needed to be uh, for creation of these projects and also just to allow the contractors some time to get experience with the technology and then our office, uh, the, through central office, the EMT unit, we were the ones uh, reviewing it last year, and we're doing it again this year, too, just so we can help out and make sure that everybody understands how to create the projects and forms in the correct manner. The submittal you'll see uh, right now is two times per week, and the reason behind that is just because there is a learning curve. It's one thing to take a class to learn how to use the software versus having to do it yourself, and so we aren't having the requirement of daily submittals quite yet um, just because there is that time period we wanted to give to our contractors to be able to learn how to create these submittals correctly and have the time to be able to contact us if they needed help with anything. So next year, the only thing that's going to change for 2019 is we are going to roll over the review of the projects, the VEDA projects and forms to our contractors. So we are going to require them, or excuse me, our districts, we're going to start requiring our districts to review the submittals. And again, we'll be helping them out with that process. Uh, this year, we are starting our training on that for the districts, and we'll provide training again next year such that they know how to review the submittals from our contractors. So with that learning curve in there, we're still not modifying our submittals yet, so it'll still be two times per week just to allow, allow folks that learning curve on the state side of things uh, to be able to support the technology. So, And you'll notice in 2020, the only thing that's going to be changing here and beyond is we are going to look towards some sort of requirement where it's going to be required to submit the beta projects and forms daily. So what that will look like, we'll have to figure out the language for that, but that is the direction and our goal to be able to provide more real-time review of workmanship issues. So regardless of the submittals, one can still look at the data anytime to identify workmanship issues. So it's not delayed by these submittals and stuff. So, uh, so we are showing people how to do that. So if they're wanting that power on the state side of things, they could do it sooner to be able to look at workmanship issues. And we'll continue to do so from our office also. 
VEDA classes, you know, again, so it has required, we didn't dump it on the contractors right away or even the state agency because it does require exposure. So you can see here back in 2012, we already started doing training here uh, through the FHWA uh, to our contractors, consultants, uh, state agency personnel. So uh, you can see we had the FHWA did training for 2012, 13, and 15 here where we had hands-on experience with the VEDA software. And MnDOT took it over in 2016. So you can see we've had anywhere from 10 to 12 classes every year uh, with about 200 attendees uh, for these classes and we are working on an e-learning class and hope to have that ready and available to folks next year for implementation so whether we'd fully get rid of the lecture-led classes we'll have to figure that out and we'll, we'll talk to the people that are taking the classes and stuff too to see what their preference is if they want to have both available for that transition period or not spec highlights uh, just in case folks aren't aware, there are two provisions that are out there through ASHTO right now. So your PP80 here is for your continuous thermal profile of asphalt mixtures. Uh, PP81 here is the intelligent compaction technology. And this next one here that doesn't have a number here is a new one that we're working on that should be going out this year for ballot where we are working on a file format of intelligent intelligent construction data. So this is to allow the vendors to start working on standardized um, formats of their data files for direct import into VEDA. So that provisional is currently being reviewed by industry and we hope to have that submitted here to ASHTO here by sometime here in March for, for folks to start reviewing here. Standardized naming conventions for the data lots. I'm not going to go into it for de in detail just because we don't have enough time here today, but I do want folks to be aware of that we are moving forward. It's in the ASTRO provisionals of a standardized naming convention for your data lots. And the reasoning we're doing this is because there's so much data that's associated with thermal profiling and intelligent compaction technology that we need a means of being able to filter it in a quicker fashion in VEDA. And so by having a standardized naming convention, we are able to automate certain components and aspects in VEDA so that the contractors don't have to do every step uh, for creation and splitting apart the data from the entire data set so and if anybody has questions on that you know feel free to give me a call and I can go through it in detail of the standardized naming convention but we do recommend to for you, those states and agencies out there to start including it in your provisions uh, to get folks uh, familiar with it and that they're they know how to use it and how to enter that information with the associated technology so the basic format you can see here you know we have the route a material a lift and then either center line offsets or some states you do use lane numbers and so we allow for both but so you can see an example here uh, this lane here is trunk highway 94 it was hot mix asphalt lift one you just put it l1 and then here's your center line offset so 60 left to 48 left and so we have been using this quite a few years here in minnesota and the automation and VEDA has substantially reduced the amount of time for creating a VEDA project so we found it cut it down by about 90 percent time so it's significant and well worth uh, folks to start moving forward with this and the industry side of things, they know we are moving forward with this too, and so they are going to start looking into ways of modifying their software too to allow for the standardized naming convention that the states would be using to make it easier for the contractors to be able to import input those parameters. For thermal profiling, we do have a monetary price adjustment for thermal coverage, and the reason we added this to our specifications is we were having issues with uh, not all the data being collected out there on projects. So just to help out with that, uh, we did put a requirement in there that they need to achieve 70% uh, thermal coverage for no price adjustment, and anything below that, they would have a prorated uh, disincentive associated with it based on the length of the project. So 70% we knew would be an easy number for folks to achieve. We haven't modified it yet. Everybody's well within the 90 percentile there. Uh, we started lower just because we didn't know what the durability was of the equipment out there and then also just the learning curve for our contractors. We didn't want to start too high and steep for them as we were trying to gain knowledge of how durable that equipment was and just to give them that timeline there to be able to start familiarizing themselves with the technology. 
Thermal segregation, so the main component of the provision that most of the states are using is we do categorize the surface temperature measurements to identify what we think the uniformity level is of the, of the surface temperature measurements. So with that, we are currently excluding temperatures less than 180 degrees. And the reason for that is you do get uh, the person that's on the screen, they'll be doing checks behind the paver, so they do get scanned here and there or those walking behind uh, the scanner. And so we do want to be able to remove uh, temperatures such as that and for those brackets used for rides. So those that aren't in contact with the pavement typically will hover around 165 to 175 for a temperature range. And so we do want to remove those brackets that are used for ride uh, from the thermal segregation analysis. The other thing that we do right now is we do remove paver stops that are greater than one minute in length. And so we do remove in the data set here two feet prior to the pavement stop and eight feet after. And the reason for that is right now we believe that we are removing the effects of paver stops through our ride specification. So until we can start overlaying our ride on top of our surface temperature measurements, we're going to leave the two separate and evaluate where we want how we want to move forward with paver stops, if we're going to just leave it solely addressed in the ride spec or if we need to put something in the, the thermal spec. Uh, most of you are aware that does get tricky uh, trying to put paver stops into your thermal segregation analysis of what criteria one would use for that too. We do require the removal of the cold edges um, and from lanes or echelon paving and ride brackets. So in VEDA, we do have statistics that Bruce Tanquist helped us with here at the state uh, to allow for cold edge and the ride bracket to be removed. So we do require that also. So here's an example here where they were paving. You can see it's an echelon. There's a paver up above, and they were paving the, the turn lane here, and the scanner was set out and was capturing some of that turn lane. So using this and selecting this parameter here, you can see the checkbox there in the, in the VEDA software allows us to use statistics to automatically grab and remove that so you don't have to pan through all your data to try to find that information. The other thing is that sometimes you get a slight adjacent edge of the cold the cold adjacent material and so we do have a statistic in there to be able to find that so uh, because it is hard to get those sensors the scanners to go all the way out to the edge perfectly and we don't want our contractors in setting it a little bit where we are missing those longitudinal joints and so we would rather have a statistic to remove any of the, the adjacent material that might be captured with it. And here's just a picture of the of rides. So most of it, you can see here is a, a bracket used for ride here. It's a non-contact sonic sensor. You can see the, the measurement here. This is the scan going transversely across behind there. And so it does pick up these brackets. Uh, here's another picture here from another project where you can see both of the ride brackets were captured there. So and they're running a little bit higher where that 180 degrees wouldn't remove those cases. So especially the one on the left here. So we do, again, use that statistic to be able to automatically remove these from our data sets. Currently, our specification, we do calculate the rain statistic. And what it looks at is all your surface temperature measurements. And it looks at your 98.5 percentile and your 1 percentile and takes a difference between those. So that differential is uh, called the rain statistic. And this is stuff that a lot of the states are using here uh, that was developed by Washington State and TTI. There's a lot of documentation on the statistic. So currently, our spec has this parameter in there for identification of thermal segregation. So here you can see how we're categorizing it. So looking at that differential between the 98.5 percentile and your 1 percentile, if that difference is less than 25 degrees Fahrenheit, we consider it as low thermal segregation. If it's between 25 and 50, it's moderate. And greater than 50, we consider it as high thermal segregation. And so we do have a monetary price adjustment associated with that. And you'll notice the word on all of these is per lot, it's per sublot. It's calculated per sublot. And that's every 150 feet is what we have for a requirement for our sublot length. So if that sublot, the 150 feet, is considered low, we give them a $20 incentive. Moderate, there's no pay adjustment. And severe, there's a $20 disincentive. So we started low with our price adjustments, again, just because we wanted to give the contractors an opportunity to get used to using the technology. And also, we wanted to, again, make sure that the statistic was working adequately out there for Minnesota conditions. And so we did start low because we didn't want the risk to be too high for our contractors too soon. And so hence, you'll see the $20 uh, price adjustment per sublot. Anything at that last sublot we know doesn't always equal 150 feet. And so we do prorate that last sublot for those, those cases where it's not, where it's above or below the 150. 
the payment, we do require a lump sum, so we have a pay item there because we do know it costs money to be able to send the data to remote server and set up of the equipment out there. So we did work with our contractors and we did set up a pay item for lump sum payment and that considers all the prices associated with the special provision. In 2018, I just wanted to let everybody know um, we are piloting a new parameter for categorizing thermal segregation. And the reason behind that, you can see an example here from one of our projects. Uh, the range statistic, again, that's that differential between your 98.5 percentile and your 1 percentile. Categorize this sublot here for this example here as low thermal segregation. And you can see a lot of thermal streaking going on in this sublot. And so what we were finding was the, the range statistic was not able to identify key cases where we had thermal streaking going on in our data sets. And on this project in particular, our inspectors out there were able to identify material segregation on the project too. So, so we started looking into it to see, okay, now we have the, the ability through VEDA to start looking at the data geospatially uh, to be able to better categorize thermal segregation instead of using that univariate statistic, uh, using that range statistic. And so for this case out in the field, they were able to identify it as severe thermal segregation, material segregation, and using our new indice, um, we also identify it as severe segregation. And so what we're using with our new one, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, is we are looking and using semivariograms. And you can see the little top quote uh, from a professor, closer things are more predictable and have less variability while distant things are less predictable and are less related. And that's pretty much how this statistic looks. And so what it does is if you had a point here on the mat, it'll look at one foot away from all the points. It'll look at two feet away from this point and three foot. And it'll do that with each of the points, all the points across laterally and transversely across your, your sublot there. And so that's what we started looking at. And so then what it does is it looks at all the variability of all those differentials that were one foot apart, how much variability is there? There, It drops it in the bucket and calculates what that vari variance would be. Everything that's two feet apart, it would drop that in the bucket and then you can calculate the variance there for the two feet apart. And so from that you are able to get a good idea of how much variability you have with respect to distance from all the points. And so Bruce was kind enough to be able to mine all our data and look at this and we were able to create a thermal segregation index and with that the first parameter is we wanted to look at the variability two-dimensional across each sublot and what Bruce found was that the standard deviation was pretty much equal to your sill, that variance uh, that we got from the semi-variogram. And obviously a standard deviation is much easier to calculate and quicker in a software than calculate variance. And so we are using the standard deviation to be able to identify geospatial ver variability uh, two-dimensionally in our each sublet. But again, that's not going to capture that streaking that we're seeing. And so we did run a transverse semi-variogram, a semi-variogram transversely across the width of the pavement to be able to identify that streaking. So again, using that same concept of the semi-variogram, but we're just running it across the width to be able to look at the variance in the temperature measurements. And with those using, we thought each parameter was equally important, so weighting them 50% is how we calculate our thermal segregation index. Uh, these other numbers here, if you wanted to look at the standard deviation, we do give a moderate severity level of 4.5 and severe for 9. Uh, the transverse semi-variogram, looking at that, a 10 and a 25 are the thresholds for the moderate and severe starts. And as a composite here, our starts for both the moderate and severe are 30 and 70, just to kind of put it in perspective. And these are inputs in beta, so those of you that are a beta user, you'll be able to, to see where these numbers are important and how to enter those into to beta. So here's an example, some screenshots of some sublots. So you can look at that two-dimensional variation, again, your standard deviation. So we're categorizing and again, low is less than four and a half. And so here's an example of one that was close to three degrees Fahrenheit for standard deviation. And you can see what the uniformity is on there uh, going two dimensionally. Looking at a moderate is the second one here. We're categorizing moderate as between four and a half and nine. Uh, this one here is close to seven. So you can see some, some variation going on along here. And this last one here is what we're considering as severe a thermal segregation. This gap here in the, the measurements, and this is because of a, a paver stop. Again, we were removing paver stops from the analysis, and so that's why you're not seeing any data for this sublot example here. 
And transversely looking at it, so again, this is to identify thermal streaking. So again, this vertical axis here is your variance. So how much variability you have, the higher the number, the more variable it is. And here again are those buckets, that lag distance, where you're looking at one foot apart, two foot apart uh, between all the points transversely across, where it was going transversely across your entire 150 feet and compiling them all into those lag distances. So what we found was if the slope was fairly, pop, fairly flat so, slope, excuse me if I could talk, uh, that we had less streaking identified there. And you can see that up in this top one here, we didn't have, identify any thermal streaking going on. Here we had a TSI of 17. So again, our this index we are capping at 100, so it's an indice that goes from 0 to 100, 100 being more, more thermal segregation, more severe. And so here's an example here where you can see some, some long, some longitudinal streaking here going across here. So again, this is your variance. So as you're getting over to about two and a half feet, and you can see about the, the distance here of two and a half feet between a lot of these points is where you see a lot of the thermal segregation that's streaking. And so you can see the highest variance. And then it starts getting more uniform. The greater distance you come out, um, and then you can see an example of five feet apart where the measurements would match, right? And so that's why you're getting less variance. And so looking at the some of the slopes going down, we are able to, to create an indice to identify what kind of variability you have going transversely across each sublot. So this example here, we have a, a thermal segregation index of 100. We're categorizing it as severe. Our price adjustments, too, we are, with this pilot spec, we are increasing them to $40 per sublot. And um, I'm going to get rid of this here. Can you see that on your screen, Bob? There we go, got rid of it. Sorry about that, you guys. So the price adjustment, we are capping at $40 incentive per sublot and a $40 disincentive per sublot. And we are making it a linear model, so you can see here, to provide more carrot for folks. So one of the things with that $20 disincentive and incentive, we found that uh, blatantly some of the individuals out there did not care because it wasn't a big enough dollar amount to care to make changes to their workmanship issue. And that wasn't everybody, but some folks. And so we do want to start rewarding people that are doing a good job and bringing out extra equipment. It costs time and money to bring out extra equipment to make it more uniform product out there. So we do want to incentivize those folks more. And then also those that aren't making any changes to increase their uniformity and measurements, we also want them to care a little more. And so that's why we are using this linear model and uh, for increasing it to $40 per sublot. I don't know, are there any questions right now? So I'm going to roll over into the construction highlights, which is kind of the more fun part. All right. So some of the effects. So this is a common question. Well, what is this technology? How is it affecting us out in the field? What's what's improving out there? Has you have you seen any changes? And and we have in Minnesota. So just using the intelligent compaction and thermal profiling technology out there, we've seen reduction in paver speeds out there. So to help get that uniform thermal measurements behind the paver, we've seen a reduce you know steps to reduce the number of paver stops. Additional rollers brought out there to ensure that they're getting uniform coverage behind their pavers. Uh, modifications to the rolling patterns, delivery method changes. We're seeing differences in the queuing of the trucks, uh, how many trucks are sitting out on site. We're seeing equipment considerations where they're starting to bring out different equipment out there. If they're using an end dump, they might change and start using a pickup machine out there uh, with a remixer to help get uniformity, uh, paying attention to their, their wind rows out there to make sure they're not driving over it, uh, tarping their trucks. Monitoring stockpiles, we are able to see moisture effects in the mixes with the thermal, thermal measurements, so they're starting to monitor those a little more. The other thing that we've been getting is a lot of requests for paving crew summaries. So folks are starting to be interested in seeing how each crew is doing and how they can improve. So it's nice that we're getting these calls and people are, are caring about how well they're doing out there. So And again, that just piggybacks into taking pride in what they were doing. So here's an example of a project where an end up was being used. Uh, this is a, the temperature measurements immediately behind the paver. So the reds and the pinks are hot. The greens and blues are going cooler. So down below here, you, on the vertical axis, you can see the timestamp. 
And then here's the linear distance. So each of these red bars is a paver stop. And so you can see the cyclic end of the truckloads here with the end dump. And so what we found with analyzing this data that 100% of the sublots were in the severe category. So, and again, it's just a reminder, you know, to make sure that they, they are allowing the material to move against the end gate as they're releasing it. So it goes into the, the hopper as a mass to help prevent and minimize material and thermal segregation. So in the same job, same contractor, to improve their thermal uniformity, they brought out a pickup machine and started using a belly dump out there. And so you can see the thermal profile is much more uniform. They had less paver stops, and they were able to knock down that severe thermal segregation down to 13% and the moderate to 88. So they saw a significant improvement just by bringing out a pickup machine out there on the project. Uh, here's another project. Uh, Greg Johnson was on this one here. Here's the percent of sublots and the different material uh, methods for delivery. So the first one here is the end dump, second one's the pickup machine, and the third is using a material transfer device. So all the green bars are indicating low thermal segregation, the blue is moderate, and red is the severe. So you can see with the end dump how non-uniform it was. So again, each of these methods was the same contractor in the same project. So you can see about 70% of the thermal segregation was in the severe category. Using the pickup machine, they were able to drop down the severe down to 40% and moderate to 56. And then the material transfer device, you can see how much more uniform it was. They were able to get their low thermal segregation category down to, you know, up to 60% and their severe down to 9%. So we're not saying you have to use material transfer device, but there's different methods that can be used out there to help gain uniformity. So there's very well a lot of contractors out there that can get very uniform product without using a material transfer device. You are able to detect high temperatures, uh, temperature changes at the plant on the project too with these surface temperature measurements with the thermal profiling method. We're also able to capture that delivery method. So here's an example here. You can see the wind row from the belly dump and they weren't overlapping the wind rows here. And so you get this gap. So over here's the screen. Uh, and you can see here's a paver stop, that cooler material. And here you can see that longitudinal streaking that we were talking about before. So it's picking up this area here on the screen live out there. So real time contractors are able to see what's going on out there. And then post-processing in VEDA, we're also able to see it. And you can see the streaking right down here showing up in the, in the data. And then here's that 12 minute paver stop up there. So you are able to see this information uh, both live and uh, later on in VEDA. Here's another example here on this project. The truck driver was driving over the wind rows. It's a little hard just because the sun reflection on the screen, but you can see the streaking here on the edges and stuff. So it was picking up that cool material there from, from the wind row being driven over and the material segregation there. And you can also see it in beta here with the streaking showing up there. So again, we are able to identify a lot of workmanship issues out there. On this project, um, they had close to I think it was 60% overall originally as they first got started on there. So this this example here from this data set, about 40% of the sublots were in the severe severe thermal segregation category on this. And upon a site visit out there, there's a lot of non-overlapping wind rows, kind of like what you're seeing in those other pictures, large amounts of trucks on site just sitting on the side and material on the grade. So they were dumping early and there was tons of material just sitting out there cooling out there. So there's a lot of thermal segregation. So the contractor for this case did make some changes to their production efforts. And you can see how much more uniform it is. And they're able to get their severe category down to 3%. And so they started dumping the, the material slower in front of the paver and they were kind of staying 30 to 40 feet in front of the paver for the for this case they tarped the trucks so none of the trucks were out there with tarps when they first came out and so they were requiring all trucks to be tarped otherwise they weren't to return and then they also modified their truck queuing so there was a lot less trucks waiting on site so they were able to improve their thermal measurements just by making some of these changes to the production. It's stuff everyone knows, it's the basics 101, but now we're able to capture it with the technology out there to see and help ensure that some of these changes are being done. As we all know, paver stops are also a concern, so they can affect durability or density or ride, um, and so we do want to try to mitigate the number of paver stops out there, and most of them are preventable. Obviously, sometimes you might have something that happens out in the the plants and stuff that you can't control, but a lot of them can be controlled just by changing the speed of the paver and the truck queuing. 
Here's an example. Kurt uh, ran through some of the thermal data and compared it to to ride. And you can see for this case here, you know, he was able to identify the ALR spikes in the ALR matching up with these paver stops, which are the the items here in blue. So there were cases also that he wasn't able to line it up, but we know there's other items out there that can affect ride too, right? Culverts and and other practices out there during the paving operation. So so again, it's just a good reminder that you know roughness can be created by paver stops. So just one other parameter that one can improve on to try to reduce the high ALR measurements out there. Uh, making sure that the, the paper doesn't run dry. You know, this, this does show up in the thermal measurements also, and you can see here we had a lot of streaking coming through as that uh, cold material was coming in from that, that hopper that wasn't fully filled. Moisture. Uh, this project here, there were heavy rain events, and the stockpiles weren't dried out thoroughly before paving, and so thermal can capture wet aggregate. And so you can see over here they were they were fairly uniform, and then all of a sudden we started getting into these sections that were very cool temperatures, around 180. You can see there to 225. So we were able to identify that wet saturated aggregate coming through the the paver. So just another reminder to make sure that stockpiles are monitoring, are being monitored. Uh, here's an example where there's a few issues going here. The hoppers spilling over. Uh, you have the tack being picked up, and so you have a lot of tack conglomerates being spit out. So, you know, the, the thermal will pick that up too. So you can see this cold material from that that was overfilled over the hopper coming out on the pavement and these darker blue ones are these tack conglomerates that are showing up in the pavement so all this information can be also found in here and identified so again back to good construction practices and then also another item is we are able to identify when those wings of the hopper are being folded in on the paver. So another thing that can cause material and thermal segregation. So you can see here, they've folded it. You can see it in the picture here, but we also can see it in the thermal segregation measurements. You can see see this uh, thermal temperatures measuring the, you know, that material segregation out there. Uh, here, this was just from this last year here. Um, one of our materials engineers saw some material segregation on the project and was asking if the surface temperature measurements were able to find that. And you can see the, the measurements were able to show the material segregation in there. We did see a cooler temperature out there. So it does a good job with capturing that material segregation out there. Considering equipment out there, again, uh, used during the paving operation. This is an example where a contractor had a pickup machine with a remixer out there. Uh, they were nice enough to turn the remixer off for us for a while, so you can see what the data acquisition unit was showing out there. So there was some non-uniform non temperatures out there, and then when they started turning the remixer on and that material is coming through and out the paver, you can see how much more uniform it was. So, you know, different equipment out there will help help achieve more uniform temperature measurements. Uh, here's another example where the contractor was using a remixing pickup machine, and you can see how, this is just a snapshot of their thermal profile, but you can see how uniform this is. It looks beautiful. And here's just zooming in on the sublot. So they had about 70% in the low thermal segregation category just using that, and 30% in the moderate, and you can see close to zero in the severe. So definitely for this, in, you know, this group, it made a big contribution to achieving uniform surface temperature measurements. Uh, this is just kind of a funny one. Um, we're trying to figure out what was going on out in the field. So just kind of a reminder that obstructions can be picked up in the in the scan. So for this case here, it was picking up the screed operator. He was extremely tall, and um, he was being scanned in there. Um, and so we were able to, to pick him up in the measurements. So obviously it's not exactly at uh, human temperature here, but it's getting a little bit of the pavement plus their head in there and averaging it out. So uh, for this case here, they weren't able to... Um, modify where the bracket was welded on there for the scanner just because it was a rental paver, but um, they did have their individual move a little bit so he wasn't getting picked up with his tall stature on the scanner. So just kind of another reminder that uh, that information does get picked up in it and it's not always removed, so it could affect sur surface measurements and your thermal segregation, even though it's a, an innocent thing. But are there any questions on workmanship issues? All right, with that then, I'm just gonna move on to a, a quick VEDA demonstration. Um, and here, let me make it bigger. Does it look okay on the screen over there for you? 
All right, perfect. So Veeam is a software, and it's similar to ProVal. So we're following the same path as ProVal, where we need a, a non-standard, you know, we need some sort of software to be able to bring in non-standard data from different vendors. So uh, it's our way of standardizing it to be able to look at it all from all the different vendors in the same means, because none of us have the time or the money to be able to be purchasing all the different software out there and trying to interpret it. So we started creating Veda, and the, you'll notice those of you that are ProVal users, it's very similar uh, in setup. Up, and we did that purposely just so folks that are uh, very familiar with ProVal wouldn't have too many issues trying to drive around the beta software. So uh, in here, you can see there's the standard icons here for saving if you want to take snapshots. Um, these are the little options here. If you would like SI units, you can put it in SI versus English. Um, and then a little help screen here. So projects in here, you can uh, go into the properties and you can see here if we're just using Minnesota County here that we converted it into uh, UTM zone 14. And so this is a thermal profiling, so it was actually captured in GPS. So, but you can put all this information in there. Uh, adding files is the next menu here. So you can add data files either through exported files from the proprietary software or downloaded data directly from the vendor's remote server. So we are moving towards the downloaded data, but we have not been able to do this with every vendor yet. And what that means is it makes it quicker uh, to be able to create the projects when you're able to grab the, the measurements directly from their software versus having to use an export. And it also helps ensure that there's no tampering of the data. So some of the vendors out there, in particular for intelligent compaction, it's a D-based format, so you can get into there. So this allows the data to be secure and locked as you're bringing it into VEDA. Uh, the other thing is, is these files are huge, and a lot of states have issues with firewalls. So just here in Minnesota, we have, I won't say how many proxy servers we have, but we have a lot that our information has to go through. And so um, it does take some time, and things can time out if your files are too big. And so file management can become an issue when you're dealing with exported files. So Right now, um, since we're talking thermal profiling, MOBA, we are able to download their data directly into VEDA. So currently, they're the thermal profiling vendor out on the market here. So we can download it directly from their e-routes and bring it into VEDA. The other item here is an alignment file. So if you do have an alignment file out there, you are able to bring it in to VEDA to be able to overlay your data on top of the alignment file, which is nice when you're trying to figure out what's going on out there and troubleshoot things. One can also do a report in here. You can do a PDF report of, of the different information. You can see, you can look export raw data, uh, summaries of your speed and temperature, your analysis uh, information, and some general. Excel here, you can, again, have an Excel export of your analysis results and your raw data, and you can also do it in a text format. So. The viewer itself, that's where I'm in here. Um, you know, I don't drive around in here too much, but it's just a, a viewer so that you can look at your data in a larger screen. So we do have ways of zooming in. You can use this little X. So those of you that have used ArcGIS, you can um, have similar features to that. So you can zoom in closer here uh, using this little square here. Uh, you can return to your previous zoom level here. Uh, you can also use these to zoom in and zoom out uh, with with the little buttons there. And those of you that have a mouse with a roller, you can use that also to zoom in and out. In the Zoom 2, we also have that you can zoom into the first location. So you can see where they start paving, the paving operations. So for this example here, we now know they started the paving operation here on the east side, and they were paving west. And we can also zoom to the last location. And so you can see here where they ended the paving operation for the day. So. If you want to look at the extent of the data, you can click on here, and it'll zoom out so you can see the overall extent of the data. So if I turn the alignment file off here, you can see the, the entire limits of the measurements there. And you'll notice a gap here, So, and you can see our line work. So if you wanted to see what was going on, I'm not, I don't know if I'm connected to the internet. Well, I guess I am if I'm in here. But you can view and show aerial maps in here. Uh, so you can see here why there was no measurements there is because we had a concrete bridge coming through. So, uh, so you can use the satellite imagery. You got to remember again the imagery isn't precise like a design file would be. So, uh, do be aware of that that there can be shifting of the data on there. Uh, the other thing is is the the MOVA data here the GPS. You'll notice that we are um, not exactly on the center line here, and it's just due to the accuracy of the system. So, uh, so there will be some shifting of the data. We do have a ruler here, so if you're wanting to measure things, uh, you can measure distances uh, to look at things there. 
uh, again, you can export images and the data from here. Right now, you'll notice that we are looking at surface temperature measurements. So the reds and the purples are the higher temperatures and your blues down here are the cooler temperatures. So if we were wanting to look at paver speed, we would just go to this data menu here and switch over to speed. And then you could see their paver speed. So you can see here, they're going about 60 feet per minute because I have it set at English units. The alignment file, you can turn that on or off. So some people don't have alignment files for that. So then you can use the roadmap view if you want just to kind of get a general idea of, of where you are within the, the project here. So uh, since we do have an alignment file, we typically like having our alignment file on for our case. The next menu here are data files. Uh, you'll notice we just we don't have all our data files here. We made a smaller project here just for quick quick illustration purposes for today. But you can see the the different files here, uh, the file size when it was imported, if there's any valid invalid coordinates and so forth, and some of the other information that was typed in from the paver operator that was operating the screen back there in the data acquisition unit. So here you can see this was for a warm mix, it looks like, lift one, center lines of 14 right that he was showing. Alignment file. Oh, and back in the data files too, you can delete them if you, if you have a record that you want to remove or you can add them back in. Here's the alignment file. So again, you can you know, play around with the different levels here. I won't go into that with the alignment file, but we use that a little more with the intelligent compaction data where we'll label things a little differently. Now the filters, this is pretty much where we hang out a lot. And again, you're getting tons of data there and you're wanting to be able to filter down to a certain situation. And so for our case, we had talked about that we like to look at the temperatures that are 180 degrees or more. And so you can create a data filter here, as you can see here, where we are filtering by temperature. So you can see here, we set it to greater than or equal to 180. Now, if we wanted to, we could have set up a speed filter here too with your min and max and put those parameters in there. But right now for our requirements, we're not looking at speed, we're just looking at surface temperatures. So we only have uh, temperatures less than 180 being removed. Now the other thing that we can do with the filters is we can create these operation filters. And in there, you can choose which files you want to have selected. So by default, we have that part automated based on that standardized naming convention we talked about earlier. So here's our that data lot up here, as you can see, our route, material type, lifts, and centerline offsets. And then also we put the paving date in there, and I can show you that in a little bit. And so it automatically knows what our paving date is that we want to have added to it. Sensor locations, so again, this is a scanner being used here, but it's still gridded data, and so each of those grids is considered a sensor location, so that's why you can see those. So we do require 100% of the data that is being collected to be filtered in there, so that's why you see them all selected. Machine ID, so sometimes you do have projects that have echelon paving, and you might have more than one paver, so uh, theoretically for a certain data set, you shouldn't have more than one paver in there for that file, so something's wrong there if you do see that, but you are able to see what the serial number is if you're having issues out there with a certain data acquisition system to be able to troubleshoot it. Time filter, you can put that in there, so you can, you can filter by a specific date or a range. Uh, here's that cold edge and ride bracket that we were talking about, so you can turn it on and off. So again, we do require that those cold temperatures to be statistically removed that are from echelon paving or from those ride brackets. And we do have a, a location filter, so one can make a, a filter in here to be able to chop the data. So you can see for this example here, we cut the data based on that exception, that bridge there. And so we have it uh, showing up on there if I put that aerial map back on. So you can see we, we cut the data there, so it would trim it right there at the bridge. Are there any questions on the operation filter? So again, this just allows you to be able to view the data into smaller subsets and clean it. So a lot of times you have a lot of extra extraneous data that's added in there, and it allows you the ability to trim and cut it uh, to whatever means that you need to meet your requirements. We do have override filters uh, for this case if you needed to override. Um, by a paver, for instance. Uh, we use that quite a bit for the IC where we're going to override a, by a roller if we wanted to look at just one roller. Uh, but you can see here under the crates are the different things you can create. You can create a filter group, data filter, operation filter. Again, these the data, and here's your operation filters over there. Exclusions, if you want to chop a section out of there, you just click on the map and you can exclude it. Or if you have known rover coordinates for it, you can exclude it that way. So. Sublots you're able to add in here. So you can see right down here where my cursor is, 
uh, to meet our spec, we have it set at 150 foot uh, sections. And so you can see we have it already drawn in here. So you can see all of our sublots. And so we are able then to cut the data uh, with these 150 foot sublots to analyze and get statistics for each of these. And again, you can zoom to the first location if you're wanting to see where that pin is. So this is another thing we have automated. So originally we had to click on the map to be able to add the start and end limits. And so we do have that automated uh, with this filter group up above. So it automatically will select your start and end and create the sublets for us so we don't have to do that. Spot test, I don't have any in here right now, but if, if we had spot test in there, that would be anything that you have out there that you have GPS coordinates associated with it. So if you had a core density out there and you wanted to overlay it on the data, you could put it in here and look at what that density was relative to the surface temperature measurements in the area. And analysis, here's the platform then to start performing those statistics that we were talking about earlier. So in the setup screen up above here, you can see we can turn this, we can check this to turn paper stops on or remove them. Um, you can select if you want to analyze speed and temperature uh, to analyze per sublet and to include that semi-variogram, that's that thermal segregation index that we were talking about. Up uh, here is the duration of your paver stops and the radius here, that's if you have spot tests in there. So what that says is with that spot test, that core density area, by default it has 3.28 feet in there. It's just the half width of a roller drum, but it'll look and average your surface temperature measurements in the uh, 3.28 feet for this example area below that spot test. So then you could do correlations if you're wanting to. Uh, speed, if you had specification requirements for speed, you could put those in. Uh, temperature, you could put those in. Here's that differential we were talking about in the thermal segregation index. It gives coverage results, so I'm just going to fly through here. We have the thermal profile here that you can look at with respect to your paver stops and your paver speed. So you can see each of these bars is a paver stop. If we wanted to zoom in, we just use our left mouse on here and we can zoom into an area. So you can see right here is that paver stop that I just zoomed into. If I want to look at that entire paving, I could just go back to zoom to fit to see the entire thermal profile. Uh, paver stops, this is a fun place to hang out in. Um, it's nice to see what these paver stops are. So you can see on here, I didn't remove them just so you guys could see what the paver stops were. But again, we were paving from right to the left here. So here's a two minute one. And you can see the cool material coming out after that two minutes. So let's just zoom to, um, there's a 16 minute one in here. So if you click on the table here, we can zoom to that paver stop and you can see how cold it is right there at 16 minutes. So that white area there is between 150 and 200 degrees. So at 16 minutes, there's a lot of cool material coming out at the paver after that paver stop. So, so you can look at that, what the timestamps were for that and the locations. Overall, there's overall histogram. So you can see the overall histogram of paving speed, a histogram of temperature measurements, and then you can also look at sublot results. And as you click here, it will show you which, which sublot you're looking at over here so you can see what the numbers are. So here's the differential statistics and that semi-variogram, that transverse semi-variogram, if you're wanting to look at it that we were talking about before per sublot, you can, can scroll through here and, and look at that information. The individual sublot results are under this category here, and so you can see all the statistics associated with each sublot. And the one in particular we usually hang out in is this temperature one. And if you look at the mean here, you can see the overall average of each sublot over time. If you look here is that differential, so this is where those percentages that we were showing you earlier, so 37% of the sublots for this example I'm showing you are in the severe category and 75% in the moderate. And you can look at each of the measurements. Again, if I was going to click here, it'll show you where we are on the sublots for that. And then the semi-variogram, again, that's that thermal segregation index that we were looking at, that new statistic that we're piloting this summer. And so you can you can see the percentage of sublots. So with this, when we were panning through there, you guys saw a lot of trans, you know longitudinal streaking. And so that range statistic wasn't capturing it fully. And so you can see how much more sublots are in that severe category with our new statistics. So there's about 83% in the severe category there. Um, and again, you can click down here. So if we're running to look at the severe sublot, uh, we can zoom in here a little more to see what that looks like. If I could run my mouse, but uh, so you can you can zoom around and see what some of these look like. Are there any questions? And some of this, the colors, I had changed the colors, but they're not all showing up here. So definitely colors in your 
your legend will make a, a big difference here too. So definitely can add and delete different colors in here to, to show up on the, the mats, maps here. But are there any questions in here or online or crickets? <laughs> so I need John Geardy here to do a joke for you guys or something. So, but Dave's here, right? <laughs> So, but again, we're moving forward with it. A lot of the contractors are liking what they're seeing. They're using it on projects that don't require the technology even. So uh, we are seeing it out there quite a bit. So, and they are seeing the, the benefit of it. But yeah, Dave. The transverse cylinder, again, how do you familiar with So with the thermal data, it's really easy to do. So with the scan, it'll scan from, you know, one directional. It takes measurements one directional. And so each of those will be in one row. So it'll scan, even though this, the paver's moving, it's kind of skewed, but that's in one row of data where you'll have all those measurements going across. So it's easy for us to analyze it going row by row. And so what you do is you start analyzing it by one row of data, the next row, the next row, the next row, and then you can start fitting it into those leg distances, um, you know. Correct. Yep. So we're in, and so then you'll have all that information in there per sublot that it's analyzed. Correct. And then that's compiled to get your overall. And for this one, since we are doing a linear model for a monetary price adjustment, we are keeping them separate per sublot so we can do a price adjustment per sublot versus with that range statistic where it's just low, moderate, or high. Kyle. I, I think we'll keep it there. So we mined all the 2014 data to 2017 data. So there's close to 100,000 sublots that we analyzed. So we have a lot of data that we looked at and it was looking very reasonable. And the reasoning behind the equal weight is we think that two-dimensionally your variability within the sublot's important, but we also think transversely that streaking we don't want to see either. So we think they're both equally important with the performance of the pavement. So that's why we're weighting them equally. All right, with that, I guess there's no other questions online. So if anybody has questions, you know, feel free to contact me. Uh, anybody that has questions with VEDA, you know, we can definitely, we have classes coming up here for both on the contractor and consultant side of things and also on the agency, city, county, is and the state. So if folks are interested in classes and you can just go to the Advanced Materials and Technology website to see the registration or if you have trouble with that, you can contact Bob or I and we can direct you accordingly, so. All right, with that, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for attending the Research Pays Off um, webinar today. Um, the next webinar will be um, on March 20th, and the topic will be Recycled Concrete Aggregates in New Concrete Pavements with uh, Professor, Professor Reza from Minnesota State University, Mankato. Thank you very much. Forty-three. Yeah. What? Did anyone from Ohio show up? I'll check. <laughs>